Before we get going, I do have a little bit of a confession to make. Uh, when I was a kid, and I'm, I'm not embarrassed of this, but I want you to know it. Uh, I rocked these bad boys. That's me in the white, my brother in the yellow. And I loved my jam shorts. These were my favorite shorts. I'd save them up for important days throughout the summer. Uh, but unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, these went out of style. And you see this happening all throughout culture. You have the mullet, and then you have sort of the winged feather look takes over. Uh, and then you have stonewashed jeans, and it's like, oh, well, maybe we'll put some diamonds and some beads on them. That'll look nice. And then that eventually goes out of style as well. And all throughout pop culture, through fashion, technology, bands, whatever it is, things are sort of ebbing and flowing in and out of fashion. Uh, the same happens with social justice as well. You have yellow bands, you have white bands, you have purple bands, you have red bands. Buy one, get one. People are dumping ice on their head. It's crazy town out there as these things change. And the way we communicate with people ebbs and flows and models um, are different. Things, th different things begin to happen. And so the question I want to talk about today is how can your church, how can your church move from, um, long ter from, from being, talking, to, talking about things like a fad uh, and talking about foster care as if it's the next big thing and instead talking about it as something that's sustainable and long term. Over the past 13 years I've worked as creative director and founder of a design studio and we, we work mostly with um, organizations who do work where they're seeking long-term impact. And so this is a question we wrestle with all the time. So we have FAD, which we've already talked about. This is sort of like a behavioral uh, adjustment. It's this idea that, hey, um, instead of getting this one, get that one. Um, but what happens when the one you want isn't associated with the cause? What do you do? What happens when you show up with your yellow band and all your friends have on the white band? Ugh, right? So, um, so we, we tend to go with the flow on this sort of stuff. Uh, and so what I think is actually when you're attempting to make when you're attempting to make uh, social impact for sustainable change, you're asking one or more stakeholders to fundamentally change their behavior. And you cannot really change a person's behavior, behavior until you change their basic assumptions about the world. And so how do we communicate at that core level of what someone believes? How do we get at this sort of long-term sustainable change? We have to attack assumptions. Um, Stephen Covey, when talking about personal change, he says it this way. If you want to make incremental improvements, work on your behavior. If you want to make quantum leaps in improvement, work on your paradigms. So this is a pretty complex conversation, uh, and I'm going to gloss over the majority of it in order to fit it into a framework that we can work through in the next nine minutes. So first, um, we have this idea of the foundation. What is our foundational uh, thinking and believing? And as Christians, it's this idea of what does Scripture teach us? So we look at God's narrative, and we say, what does God think about the orphan? What does God think about children? What does he think about families? Theologian John Frame says it this way, um, what do God's norms direct us to believe? Uh, and so once we establish this idea, once we establish what we believe, we can begin to then set out uh, and ask, what will the world look like as a result of our work? Um, here, this is our vision, and in this idea, world is actually relative. So world might be your small group, might be your zip code, it might be your church, it might be your region, your state, whatever it is, whatever that area is you have domain in, and whatever that area is that you want to see change, what will it look like? And once we have this foundation, we, be we can begin to communicate around it, and we can also set our mission and our strategy and all these important things that we need. So, once we know what we think, what do other people think? We have to go out and ask, what are, what are the people we're talking to? What do they already believe about this situation? And when we're doing that, we're looking uh, to find out um, what insights there are. And so um, this is the why behind an observation. So if you go out and talk to people and find out that foster care is something they think you do after your kids are grown or something that you do um, when, uh, if you have a counseling degree or something like that, that's an observation. So the, the insight is the why behind that observation or the so what. So why do they think that? Um, and then we can begin to craft messages around that. And then we want to look for ways to contextualize our message. Um, the best way to get someone to adopt a new idea is to get them thinking about it in terms that they already agree with. So if your church has a homeless ministry, maybe you don't talk about foster care or something different. Maybe you start talking about the kids in that, in that ministry that need uh, care and love and things like that. So, so bring it to the people in ways that, they, um, that they're already familiar with. Once we have the uh, current assumption, we, we can begin to create new messages and new stories around that. There's actually a famous story that's attributed to David Ogilvy. It's probably made up, and Ogilvy is the... Um, is considered by some to be the father of modern advertising. It goes like this, that one day he's walking down Madison Avenue and he sees a homeless guy and the guy's standing there with a sign uh, and it says, I am blind, please help. Ogilvy looks down, the guy's collected no money. 
So Ogilvy reaches in his pocket. Instead of pulling out a, a coin, he pulls out a pen, and he changes the guy's sign to this. It is spring, and I am blind. Uh, and what happens uh, is Ogilvy comes back later in the day, and he sees that the guy's cup is overflowing with coins. So imagine what it's like for just a moment not to see the grass um, sprouting up, not to see the blooms on the trees starting to, to bud. And that idea is called empathy. Empathy allows me to place myself in someone else's shoes, and good stories are chocked full of empathy. And so we want to we tell stories um, that can give people new experiences through this idea of empathy, because our, a lot of how we see the world is made up through our personal experiences. Next, empathy leads to action. Um, Dr. Paul Zak, who's a neuroscientist, did a study and he found that when a, um, when a story follows, is semi-interesting <laughs> and follows a basic dramatic uh, structure like this one, that the, the brain releases two chemicals. The first chemical uh, is associated with distress and the second is associated with empathy. And what they found is that the more of the chemical associated with empathy that your brain releases, the more likely you are to give money to a cause associated with the story that you just heard. So here we see the brain literally triggering you towards action as a result of story. Uh, and so we want to ask people to take action. We want to give them action points along the way, and we want to make sure that we're giving them proper action uh, at the right time. It's probably not fair to stand up on Sunday morning and start talking about foster care for five minutes and then expect someone to go home and foster a kid. That's a tough ask. <laughs> What might be more appropriate, though, is to say, hey, would you pray for families in our church that are fostering? Would you take a meal? Would you follow us on Twitter so we can keep, tell you more about this or whatever? So we want to look for those moments that make sense. And so mapping out a little bit of how you think people might fl flow through the conversation um, would be helpful. So I think something like awareness to consideration to some f form of participation to becoming an advocate. So knowing where people are and how they're thinking about it will give you the right things to ask them to do. Um, and participation is key because participation normalizes. When someone is involved in foster care in some way, whether that's praying, whether it's seeing someone, whether that's reading about it, the idea of it becomes less exotic. And when it's less exotic, I'm more likely to think, hey, this is something that I could be involved in. This is something that I actually care about, and I can do something about this. And that's what we want at the end of the day. So, um, there's a lot of things that go into this, but I'm hopeful that this framework can provide you a way of thinking as you begin to communicate and talk about fostering within your context and within your church. Um, and this is set up and designed to give you um, a baseline for years and years <laughs> of, of talking about it, not just one year and then being done. There's a famous designer named uh, Saul Bass, and he says, the nature of process to one degree or another involves failure. You have at it, it doesn't work. You keep pushing, it gets better but it's not good, it gets worse, you go at it again, then you desperately stab at it, <laughs> believing that it's going to work, and it does. And I think that's what we're doing today. We're stabbing at this thing, and we're trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work, and we're trying to make each other better. And I hope that we go away from here and we implement some of these things, and we can iterate on it, and we can prototype new ideas, and as a result, boys and girls have moms and dads and loving families. Um, and so I'm encouraged by the conversation, and I'm thankful to be here. Thanks.